when I became aware of the nature and extent of state capture, it is important to note that few people, even at the best of times, have had line of sight of everything taking place in the state. And that happens to be the case even today. And this chairperson applies even to members of cabinet and the deputy president, particularly with respect to activities that were deliberately hidden from view. Many of the incidents of corruption that would in time be described as state capture became known to me as they did to the general public through the work of journalists, civil society organizations, and institutions such as the Public Protector and Auditor General. Reports of court cases and disciplinary proceedings together with the commendable work of uh, investigative journalists and whistleblowers did help to give insight into corruption in both government and in the private sector. As it became increasingly clearer through the so-called Gupta leaks and other revelations that a network of individuals was seemingly colluding with a number of people in government to occupy key positions and capture key institutions. The question that arose was how best one should respond to all this. I guess, Chairperson, this was a question that not only I myself had to grapple with, but also other members of the executive who were deeply concerned about these developments as they saw them unfolding. In my case, and I guess it also affected a number of other people, I would say I had five options. The first option for me was to resign. The second would have been to speak out. And the third would have been to acquiesce and abet and just go along. And the fourth would have been to keep quiet and remain silent. And the fifth option would have been to remain, but to resist, hoping that we can turn things around. The first option for me, Chairperson, available, that was available to me, was to resign from the executive. While I would have earned quite a lot of praise from many quarters, this action of resignation would have significantly impaired my ability to contribute to bring about what I would call an end to state capture. It would have caught the big headlines, newspapers, and that would have been the end of it. Had I and like-minded individuals resigned from the executive, we would have had no ability to resist some of the excesses that were taking place. And there was a clear danger that without some measure of resistance, there would have been even fewer impediments to the unfettered expansion of the state capture project. It was also important to pursue and sustain the many government programs that were vital to the transformation of our society and the improvement of our people's lives. The second option was to be, for me to be more confrontational, to speak out publicly against certain decisions or actions of the government as they were happening in that captured way. While there were instances where I did make public statements, there was also a limit to how confrontational 
one could be in the position that I held. A more confrontational approach would most likely have led to my removal from office with the same consequences as resignation in that my ability to effect change would have been greatly constrained if not brought to an end. The third option was to acquiesce and thereby abet the committing of the misdeeds, just to go along and be part of it all. This I would not and could not do. It would have been a violation of my principles and a profound betrayal of my responsibility to the government, my own organization and the people of South Africa. The fourth option available to me was to remain <clears throat> in my position as Deputy President and keep silent. This may have been the easier path, but it was, in my view, not much different from acquiescing and going along. The final option for me, which is what I chose, was to remain in my position as Deputy President, not to resign, not to acquiesce and go along <clears throat> and join in, or not to be confrontational, but to work with others in the executive to resist the abuses and bring about change where we could and to sustain the work of social and economic transformation. Now, this meant staying in the arena with the challenges and limitations and frustrations inherent in doing so. But it was the course of action that had the greatest likelihood of bringing state capture to an end, restoring the institutions of state, and defending our democracy. It needs to be remembered that Governance is not merely a technical function. It is an inherently political function which is influenced by the dynamics and the exercise of political power. My ability and the ability of others to resist and ultimately to bring about changes that would end state capture relied to a large measure on the political balance of forces within the executive itself, within the governing party, and within society more broadly. That was among the reasons why I chose to remain in the position of Deputy President, why I worked with others through the democratic process to shift the balance of forces, and why ultimately I agreed also to make myself available for the position of the President of the African National Congress at its 54th National Conference in December 2017. Now, with the benefit of hindsight, I'm certain that this was the necessary and correct course of action that I took. Others may not agree, but for me, this was the better and the best course of action that I could take. Fundamentally, this approach enabled the far-reaching changes the country has gone through over the past three years, including the disruption of state capture project and the rebuilding of damaged institutions. It was also possible through this approach to resist some of the more egregious and obvious abuses of power. And maybe one will cite just a few. For instance, the replacement of Mr. Ntlantla Nene as Minister of Finance with Mr. Des Van Royen provides a useful illustration of this. On the evening of 9th December 2015, former President Zuma 
announce the removal of Mr. Nene and the appointment of Mr. Van Roy. This had an immediate impact on the financial markets. Shortly after Mr. Van Rooyen was sworn in, the Director General of Treasury, Mr. Lungisa Fuzile, asked to meet me urgently. He expressed grave concern based on his interaction with the new minister and his advisors. <clears throat> great concern about the impact this development would have on the ability of National Treasury to properly exercise its function. Concerned by what I considered the capture of National Treasury, because to me the capture of National Treasury was almost the, the final culmination of, of, of state capture, because you capture national treasury, then you basically captured the entire state, because that is where the money is, that is where it is controlled. And after having that meeting with uh, the then Director General, who described to me in fairly graphic terms, how he feared that now National Treasury had been captured, uh, I also got concerned. I immediately contacted the then and now ANC Deputy Secretary General, Jesse Duarte, and indicated in a meeting with her that this is what had happened, and I was now really concerned that state capture had reached this level. And I said to her that I would resign my position, Deputy President of the Republic. And I believe that that message was conveyed uh, to the then President. Uh, and maybe that would have raised a concern, I don't know. Then there was a flurry of consultations that involved some of the ANC officials expressing disquiet about the appointment of Mr. Des Van Rooyen, the then ANC Secretary General Gwede Mantashe, Ms. Duarte and myself urged the President to appoint another person as the Finance Minister um, because the reaction in the financial markets uh, was tending to be quite horrific. And it is then that we urged that he should appoint Mr. Pravin Gord. To calm the markets and also for me to remove the specter that I saw of state capture, capturing treasury. I believe the decision by President Zuma to replace Mr. Van Rooyen with Mr. Gordon was critical in preventing further damage to the economy and safeguarding the integrity of National Treasury. And there were other instances which I detailed in my statement where it was necessary to make public statements on decisions which are considered contrary to national interest. One such instance was the removal of Mr. Kodan and uh, Mr. Mkabisi Jonas as Minister and Deputy Minister of Finance, respectively, on 30th March 2017. At the meeting, when former President Zuma informed the ANC officials of his decision, I raised my concern that the Minister and Deputy Minister were being removed on the basis of unsubstantiated intelligence report. And I told them, former president, that I disagreed with, this, with his reasons and that when asked, as I expected I would be asked by the media and other people, I would publicly state my objection. And I said that to him up front and as did other officials who also spoke out. While I reiterated that the president has the constitutional prerogative in terms of our constitution, to appoint and dismiss members of the cabinet, I felt it was necessary to speak out, especially because of the serious consequences this decision 
would have on our economy and on our country. Since assuming the office of president in 2018 February, the government that I lead has undertaken several measures to end state capture, to rebuild damaged institutions, and to foster a culture of ethical public service and accountability. In the main, the measures have aimed at changing the way the cabinet functions, strengthening institutions that had been captured, starting with changes in the leadership of some of these institutions, changing the way in which our state-owned enterprises also work, and the way they were managed and overseen by government as shareholders, a shareholder rather, and making necessary policy decisions to address shortcomings and to reinforce oversight. One of the critical projects currently underway to strengthen the state involves the professionalization of the public service. Now this aims to ensure that the public service is shorn of political partisanship, and that the most qualified individuals enter its ranks. This, this is a very current development that we foster. As this commission has heard, law enforcement agencies were deliberately weakened to limit their ability to act against those involved in corruption and state capture. It has therefore been a priority and remains an ongoing task of the administration I lead to rebuild and to restore the integrity of these institutions. I therefore decided that the appointment, for instance, of the new National Director of Public Prosecutions should be undertaken through a public and transparent process. This was the first time an NDPP was appointed in such a manner which did much to restore the confidence of South Africans in the institution. We have established the investigating directorate in the office of the NDPP to work on the high-profile complex cases of corruption and fraud. Its members have unique expertise in this field, and it has shown this entity the capacity to speed up investigations and see prosecutions do take place. The NPA has started to make significant strides in combating corruption, and I'm confident that it will continue to do so. In May 2018, I established the Nugent Commission of Inquiry to investigate governance failures at SARS and to propose ways to restore confidence of taxpayers. Its recommendations are now being implemented to redress the wrongs of the past and to ensure that SARS never again falls prey to the improper motives of a privileged few. The impact of this work is already evident at SARS. Other areas of progress include the work with the NPA's Asset Forfeiture Unit, the work that it has done to recover the proceeds of economic crimes, recapacitating the NPA with more qualified personnel, and changes in the leadership of entities such as the Public Investment Corporation. Jefferson, this has been supplemented by the work of the Fusion Center, where all relevant law enforcement entities share information and support each other in investigating these kinds of corruption. Discussion of how to institutionalize this form of cooperation are now underway. The SIU Tribunal started its work in October 2019 
and since it started its work has shown its value in recouping monies wrongfully taken from state coffers. As has been made plain in this commission, our intelligence services are in dire need of attention. To this end, the implementation of the recommendation of the high-level review panel, which was chaired by Dr. Sidney Mufamadi, is at an advanced stage. I am assured by the leadership of the relevant agencies that illegal operations identified both by the panel report and the investigations conducted by state security agency leadership are being identified and they are also being terminated. The investigations continue on these and other wrongs within the SSA and in collaboration with law enforcement agencies. COVID activities are now subject to scrutiny by the Auditor General, something that we welcome. Late in December 2019, I also reconstituted the National Security Council, which is chaired by the President to ensure better coordination of intelligence and security-related functions of the state. Political responsibility of the state's security agency now resides in the Presidency, and deliberations continue on the panel's recommendations to split up the SSA into distinct domestic and foreign intelligence services. Government envisages a fundamental overhaul of state-owned enterprises model that addresses not only the deficiencies that permitted widespread corruption, but that also enables these companies to effectively fulfill their social and economic mandates in a sustainable manner. To this end, Cabinet has established the Presidential State-Owned Enterprise Council to reposition our SOEs as effective instruments of economic development through stronger oversight and strategic management. Government is working towards an SOE ownership model that clearly separates the responsibility of ownership, policy development, and regulation. Effective ownership will become more centralized to enable greater transparency, accountability and oversight, and subject all strategic SOEs to more rigorous requirements for financial as well as operational performance. We are implementing standard guidelines on the appointment and remuneration of SOE boards and executives that prioritize the recruitment and retention of the appropriate skills and experience and competencies that we need in these bodies. This includes a clear delineation of authority and responsibility between elected public officials, non-executive directors, as well as executive leadership. Jefferson, we are working to ensure the rigorous implementation of controls over the use of public money as the best way to protect the abuse of these funds. The National Anti-Corruption Strategy, which was developed together with the representatives from business, trade unions, academia, and civil, and, and civil society, including religious organizations, was approved by Cabinet. The Health Sector Anti-Corruption Forum, which was launched in September 2019, is a critical element of our fight against corruption also. Now, legislative changes have been made and others are underway to fight corruption and reduce the likelihood of a recurrence of state capture. Now, the amendment of the Public Audit Act is a good demonstration of this to give the Auditor General more power. Now, this is a significant step in the fight against state capture as it targets the perpetrators of fraud and theft. Now, another set of powerful measures to prevent corruption and state capture include changes in the way that the public service is managed. 
Critical sections of the Public Administration Management Act have now commenced. These include the prohibition of all public service employees conducting business with the state, the development of norms and standards of integrity, ethics and discipline in the public service, and the establishment of the Office of Standards and Compliance. Further sections will be commencing this year, and legislation meant to entrench greater checks and balances in public procurement is in the pipeline and will be finalized as soon as possible. Now, Chairperson, the Commission has asked me to address several other matters, including allegations made by witnesses against me before this Commission. These are addressed in detail in the statement that I have submitted to the Commission. There is one particular issue on which I wish to comment now, since it has received such widespread attention and uh, can easily be disposed of. This relates to the allegations made by Mr. Brian Molefe and Mr. Machela Coco in relation to the stake that I held in Optima Mine prior to my entry into government and my later responsibilities in respect of uh, the ESCOM war room. While I was in business, I participated in a commercial consortium with Glencoe in the acquisition of Optimum Holding, which acquisition was concluded in June 2012. I acquired an effective 9.64% shareholding in Optimum Holdings and became a non-executive chairperson of Optimum Holdings. Uh, in that role, Chairperson, I had no operational involvement in Optimum Holdings or Optimum Mine. I was a non-executive Chairperson. Following my election as ANC Deputy President in December of 2012, I initiated a review of my business interests to avoid potential conflict. As part of this process, on the 6th of June 2013, I resigned as the director of Optimum Holdings, and on the 22nd of May 2014, I disposed of my shareholding in Optimum Holdings ahead of my appointment as Deputy President of the Republic. I had no further involvement or interest in Optimum after that point. In December 2014, President Zuma assigned to me the responsibility to oversee efforts to turn around several SOEs that were in dire straits. I was asked to give guidance and direction to existing governing structures focusing on the unique challenges of each structure. As is apparent now, this work required collective commitment by all governing structures and was a long-term endeavor. Only recently have we started to truly make progress on the challenges that a number of state-owned enterprises have been facing, such as SAA, ESCOM, and other SOEs. As part of this responsibility, I chaired an interministerial committee on resolving the country's severe energy challenges. This IMC exercised political responsibility for the ESCOM Technical War Room, which was set up to support the implementation of the Five Point Action Plan, which we can talk about, adopted by the Cabinet to address the electricity. The War Room was under the day-to-day -day direction of deputy ministers of relevant departments and comprised representatives of ESCOM and relevant departments. I was not a member of the Technical War Room. In response to the allegations made on this matter, it is necessary that 
I point out the following issues. First, my acquisition of shares in Optimum Holdings was a straightforward commercial transaction done in accordance with the regulations of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Second, as non-executive chairperson of Optimum Holdings, I was not involved in operational matters of subsidiary companies, including contractual matters between, for instance, ESCOM and Optimum Mine. In Chairperson S, I acted in a number of instances in boards of various companies as chairperson. I made it a point that as non-executive chairperson on various boards, I said, not to get involved in operational matters and not to get involved in contractual matters. To a point where in those roles I never knew but the procurement processes in those companies were, and I actually regarded that as a no limit. No limit that I should never even participate in that. And I kept to that type of protocol throughout. The third one, by the time President Zuma assigned certain ESCOM related matters to me in December 2014, I had disposed of my shareholding in Optimum Holdings and had no other business interests in mining and energy. Fourth, as is evident from the documents provided to the Commission with my statement, the ESCOM Technical War Room was not involved in ESCOM management or operational issues. I had no interest nor any opportunity to influence ESCOM's decision-making process in matters pertaining to Optima. Finally, I turn to Mr. Koko's allegation, which was also widely publicized, that I improperly interfered to procure his dismissal from ESCOM in January 2018. As I detail in my statement to the Commission, ESCOM was in a severe crisis at the time. Its domestic and international lenders were threatening to call on their loans, that is repayment, in part because of concerns about ESCOM's leadership and its reaction to allegations of corruption. ESCOM's predicament threatened its very existence as a going concern also threatened the country's sovereign rating and the country's ability to access much needed lines of, of credit. An urgent meeting was held at the President's official residence on the 19th of January 2018, attended by President Zuma, Ministers Brown and Gigaba and myself. The meeting resolved that urgent action was necessary to avert a national disaster and to restore ESCOM's credibility and to instill confidence in ESCOM. This would require changes to ESCOM's board and its leadership. The board would further be directed to remove all ESCOM executives facing allegations of corruption and other acts of impropriety, including Mr. Coco. Mr. Coco contends that his removal was an instance of unlawful interference in ESCOM's affairs, executive overreach, but he also adds state capture. The suggestion that government cannot lawfully intervene in ESCOM's affairs, even to avert a crisis, is completely incorrect. Government is ESCOM's sole shareholder, and ESCOM's Memorandum of Incorporation states that the shareholder may direct the company to take action specified by the shareholder if the company is in financial difficulty or is being mismanaged. The remedial measures thus fell substantively within the shareholder's powers 
as contemplated in ESCOM's Memorandum of Incorporation. The mere fact that Mr. Koko was removed does not mean that his removal was intended to achieve corrupt ends or somehow to end up with the capture of ESCOM. Chairperson, many people sacrificed their lives in the fight to end apartheid and to bring us to the new constitutional dispensation. Why don't we dishonor the Constitution and we dishonor its principles and values? We dishonor those people who lost their lives as well. Since state capture is an assault on the democratic process, it is necessary that the process of extricating the state from a position of capture is inclusive, but it must also be democratic and it must involve the broad range of interests in society. This is addressed in part by the public nature of this Commission's work. But the hard work will begin after this commission has finalized its hearings and submitted its report. There will be, Chairperson, a need for a partnership between citizens and all branches of the state to ensure faith is restored in our institutions and in our democracy. Putting an end to state capture will enable the state to focus its efforts and resources more effectively on the provision of public services, which is critical to the transformation and development of our society. It is worth highlighting that many of our critical institutions continued to work as they needed to and as provided for in the Constitution throughout this period as well. Now, despite the damage that has been done by state capture to public institutions during this time and the resulting impact on the provision of services, the reality is that the work of government, yes, did continue and progress has been achieved in a number of areas. This was due in part to the efforts of committed, capable, and ethical public servants and public representatives. Now the road from the period of state capture will be long. Every measure we have instituted has taken time and it has led to a lot of frustration as delays have uh, led people to lose hope and faith but it has required time and effort. And I believe, Chairperson, that we will not and we cannot relent. We've got to succeed in the task that your commission is also involved in, that we should restore the credibility of the institutions of our country and indeed repair the damage that was done to our democracy. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Mr. President.